If you have your Bible this morning, we're going to continue in our study that I've titled The Gospel Version 1.0 uh, or the first edition. And unlike uh, computer programs, how many of you realize there's not going to be a version 1.0, uh, 1.5 or 2.0 uh, or anything else? We have the one and only edition of the of the gospel of Jesus Christ as it was passed down to us. And the Bible says, let us earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And um, that's what we certainly want to do. I want to begin this morning in the book of Romans chapter 8. And I have an awful lot to say this morning. And I will just have to trust the Lord that he will fill in the gaps. Um, But I just want to draw your attention to some passages from the New Testament And then I want to go back into the Old Testament and contrast two individuals that that are very important in our understanding of being obedient to the Lord. In Romans 8 and 1, the scripture said, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Now, a lot of people like to stop right there and they don't finish The verse, but how many of you know this is sort of an if then type statement? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And if we, if we scoot down a little bit to verse five, the scripture says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. And I'm reading from the King James Version. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. Now, for those that have truly been born again, this is a revelation to folks. You are not in the flesh, but you are in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man has not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And I want to scoot down a little bit more to verse 13. For if you live after the flesh, you will die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body... You will live. Amen. Verse 14. This is the verse I want to key in on. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. When we come to Christ and and God is drawing us by His Holy Spirit, um, when we hear the gospel or uh, God maybe has been dealing with you and, and you hear the message of the gospel, The desire of the Holy Spirit and the intention is to establish His authority in our life and to establish His rule over us so that we would follow after the Holy Spirit and follow after the Lord and and to do His will. And for a lot of people, and I know for myself, and I talked about this a little bit yesterday, uh, it was difficult for me to grasp the truth of this. A lot of times we think being spiritual is a lot of different things, but truly being spiritual is being led of the Holy Spirit. It's allowing the Holy Spirit to establish God's authority in our life. Uh, You'll remember that Stephen had told the the religious leaders, you do always resist the Holy Spirit. Um, As your fathers did, so do you. You resist the authority. Um, going all the way back to Genesis 6, God said, My spirit will not always strive with man. So God is trying to strive with man to get him walking uh, in harmony with his will. But people resist the Holy Spirit. Uh, as a matter of fact, when Jesus met Paul on the road to Damascus, he told him, he said, You do always kick against the pricks, the King James said, but the word is goads. Uh, an ox goad used to be used to keep the um, oxes towing a straight line so that they could make the best use of the land. You get an ox doing its own will. How many of you know you're going to have a mess? Uh, your field is just going to be a mess. So 
you would have a person walking alongside the ox with an ox goad, and he would keep this, uh, this ox in line. And this is the illustration that the Lord used of Paul. He said, you do always, you know, you're always kicking against the pricks, as it were. You're kicking against the goads. And, um, uh, of course, his life was radically changed, and he stopped or left off resisting the Holy Spirit, and the rest is history. But this is ultimately what the Lord wants to do. He wants to establish his authority in our life. And uh, there are a lot of things that uh, people may call spiritual experiences and things like that. But God's objective is to be in charge. Um, One of the best definitions of regeneration uh, that I've heard actually comes from the scriptures when Jesus said, In the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory. Um, when we think about being regenerated of the Holy Spirit, we're thinking about the Lord sitting upon the throne, as it were, of our heart and ruling uh, from within and giving us direction. Um, All of our lives we did what was right in our own eyes, but when we finally come to the Lord and we finally surrender our life to Him, there is a radical change that takes place. God will take out the heart of stone... or the heart of stone he will give us a heart of flesh he will give us his holy spirit and cause us to walk in his ways it will be something that we do by nature whereas before it was natural for us to sin uh, it was just a normal thing after we're truly born again it will be natural for us uh, to walk in the ways of the lord but i want to draw attention to one more verse from the New Testament, and that's over in the book of Galatians chapter 3. And you'll remember that Paul the Apostle wrote the book of Galatians with his own hand. Um, It's believed that Paul had a problem with his eyesight, so I could imagine what this probably looked like when they received this letter. It was all written in probably real big letters, and um, I'm sure it really grabbed the attention of the people at Galatia. But he wrote this in chapter 3, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Verse 3. Are you so foolish Having begun in the spirit. See, that's how we begin. We begin in the spirit. Are you now made perfect by the flesh? See, they started out running well. In one place, that's what he said. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? And that's the challenge that we face Salvation is not just a one-off event. It is a crisis event followed by a process. This is why it's so important uh, that we be discipled. But I want to turn over and show you a couple of examples from the Old Testament. First and Second Chronicles 26, if you want to turn over there. And I want to show you sort of a, a picture of what it is to do what the Galatians had done. Now, there are a lot of ways that we can get in the flesh. Uh, Anything that we do that is really in response to our own imaginations or some other revelation than what God has said is an act of the flesh. The Bible talked about Ishmael being a child of the flesh. In other words, somebody had an idea that was contrary to God's revelation. You will have a child in your old age. And in responding to that other revelation, um, they had Ishmael. So that gives us a definition of the flesh in one sense. It's to respond to some other revelation, whether it's your own idea, someone else's idea, or maybe it's the enemy just, you know, planting thoughts in your mind other than what God is saying and to move on it and respond to it. And that's what had happened at Galatia. But this is, this is, not the first time this happened. You go back in Second Chronicles, and I want to show you uh, an awesome illustration of this. Now, you'll remember 
that King Uzziah, we've, we've talked about him many times, uh, in quoting from Isaiah chapter 6, King Uzziah was one of the great kings in Israel. And as a matter of fact, he started ruling when he was 16 years old. Uh, that's pretty young, isn't it? Um, nevertheless, he began ruling. And how many of you know when you're young and you really don't have a lot of strength, you tend to rely perhaps on the people around you. But in his case, he really relied upon the Lord. And I want to focus on that for just a minute. If, my, if I could just pull this passage up. Second Chronicles 26. Verse 5. Uzziah sought God in the days of Zechariah who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. In other words, as long as he sought direction from the Lord, as long as before he went to do something or when he had a situation that was before him, he didn't do what was just right in his own eyes, but he sought counsel from the Lord, um, from God's word on the one hand, or in this case, prophetically. In the days of Zechariah, perhaps God was speaking to him, maybe in dreams or in visions, and he didn't just you know, write these things off. He would go to Zechariah and he would seek the Lord and say, okay, what is God saying? What is he leading? And as long as this was his attitude, as long as this was his approach, God made him prosper. I mean, this is something that we really need to let sink deep down into our ears. Because so oftentimes, the more educated we are, the more money we have, The more popular we are, the more that we feel like we can kind of lean on our own ability. That's pretty much what we do. But that's what the scripture tells us not to do. The Bible says not to lean upon our own understanding. But in all of our ways, acknowledge him and he will direct our path. You see, our part is to do just that, not lean upon our own understanding And in all of our ways, acknowledge him. And if we'll do that, God will direct our path. If we're trying to serve the Lord, if we're living right before him, and we're we're serving God in honesty, and in our heart we know that there there are not things between us and and the Lord, God will direct us. And we can be confident of that. And it's important to realize that. And as long as we will do that, the pattern of things throughout the Old Testament into the news that God will cause us to prosper. But over time, the scripture said Uzziah, as he began to get a little bit older, watch this, verse 15. And he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers. You know, it's easy easy to begin relying on other resources. Well, we rely on our armies. We'll rely on the strength that we have, but how many of you know unless the Lord is watching over the city, the watchmen are watching it in vain? It's not about our own strength. It's not about our own ability. It's not about our own talents. When we start to lean on these things, we start to move in the arm of the flesh. His name spread far abroad, the end part of the verse says. He was famous. People were talking about him. For he was marvelously helped until he was strong. And that's the most dangerous place we can be in when we're strong. Especially when we think we're strong. The Bible said if when we think that we're strong, as it were, take heed or lest we fall. We think we stand. Pride begins to come in. And as pride comes in, we no longer seek the Lord. We begin to doing th- begin doing things presumptuously. But when he was strong, verse 16, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. Isn't that what the proverb said? Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. One of the things that God hates is a proud look. 
It's an interesting thing that when we will truly humble ourselves, the Lord will give us more grace. That's what the scripture says. When we humble ourselves, when we're not so confident in our own ability, when we're in a place to where we can just surrender ourselves to the Lord and say, God, unless you move in this situation, there is no hope for me. Verse 18, watch this. Well, let's go back to verse 16. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And Azariah the priest went in after him with 80 priests of the Lord that were valiant men. It's almost like the police came. And had to stop this man from going in and trying to function like a priest when he was the king. How many of you know that was a flagrant disregard for God's order of things? It was a flagrant disregard of God's word. And now he's getting up there in years. I don't know exactly how old he was, but I know that he passed away roughly when he was 68. He started ruling when he was 16. And somewhere way down the line, as he began to be built up in his own eyes and became strong in his own eyes, he got more and more bold and more and more reckless in the things of God. And that's a dangerous thing. You know, it doesn't matter how old we are, how much experience we have. It doesn't matter how much of any of these things that we have. The truth of the matter is, we still have to be in subjection to God's word. We still have to be in subjection to the things that, that God has said. We never are in a place where I don't have to obey that. I don't have to do what God is saying. Now watch this here. Verse 18. They withstood Uzziah the king and said to him, It does not pertain to you, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord. But to the priests, the sons of Aaron, they are the ones who are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. Watch this. It will not be for your honor from the Lord God. Think about this for a minute. Sometimes people think they're going to do something and that they're somehow going to receive some kind of honor from the Lord. But the only way we can truly receive honor from the Lord, if anything at all, is to be obedient. As soon as we're disobedient, we dishonor God. You know, a lot of times we're looking for new ways to do things or we think, well, well, I've got a better way or something like that. But uh, the truth is, it's what this passage says. For you have trespassed, neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord. It's not going to be something honorable. God's not going to praise you, as it were, for what you're doing. It's one of the hardest things that we can, not just as a young person, because when you're young, you're oftentimes, you know, very zealous for the things of God. You want to do everything by the book. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. That's what you say at 16. Let me just make an illustration. When you're 20, you're still saying, we got to do what God says. But that by the time you might get to 40 or 50, you might be kind of saying, well, you know, I don't know. I noticed that this might work. And then before you know it, you have an attitude like Uzziah and you presumptuously begin doing things. And what did David say? He said, Lord, keep me from presumptuous sins. Then I would not be guilty of the great transgression, being presumptuous about the things of God. Verse 20 And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous, a type of sin, a picture of sin. He was leprous in his forehead. And they thrust him out from thence, yea, he himself hasted to go out. How many of you know it was a lesson learned a little bit late? While they were withstanding him, While there was a voice of reason in his life saying, you really need to listen to us. 
We're trying to tell you it, it does not pertain to you to do this thing. What you're doing is against the word of God. It's against the scriptures. It was time at that point to listen. Not to wait until the leprosy was on your forehead. And then suddenly you're like, you're right. Let's get out of here. It's too late then. Because Uzziah died a leper. He died a leper. You say, well, what happened? Well, when he was small in his own eyes, he would listen to the Lord. He would take God's word seriously. He would search the scriptures to see whether certain things were true, whether we should do things a certain way, or whether the popular trend was the way to go, as it were. But the older he got, the more emboldened he became to disregard God. And this is a tremendous picture for us, if we will listen, of how these things can happen. At Galatia, Paul said it to him, you did run well. Who hath hindered you? Who's bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? And we have to be very careful. We never grow too old to simply obey God. We never outgrow God's word. Never. We never get to a place in our greatness. We never get to a place in our popularity and our wealth. You fill in the blank where we can disregard God and his word. But I have a, I guess we can say a more positive story from second Kings five. And I want to turn over there. If I were titling this lesson this morning, it would be the tale of two angry men. The tale of two angry men. Here's Uzziah. God's speaking to him through the mouth of these men who's withstanding him. But what was his reaction? He got angry. He got mad. He turned red faced. And you know, that is the beginning of our destruction. When God is speaking to us, no matter who it is, if it is God speaking, we need to have ears to hear. And if we get angry at that moment, we are at a very critical spot because we can either go right or left in that moment. You're either going to do what God says or you're going to do what you want to do. Isaiah did what he wanted to do and he suffered the consequences. And they were very desperate at that. But if we turn over to 2 Kings, I'm sorry, 2 Kings 5. I want to give you another example of a man who was also a leper. But, of course, he was a leper long before both Naaman and Uzziah ultimately had known leprosy. One man received his at the end of life. The other was cured. And in both cases, it was completely dependent upon how they responded to what God was saying. How they responded to God's word. Obedience or disobedience was the difference between having leprosy and not. You see that? I want you to see it in this verse, in this passage, rather. Now, Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, verse 1 of 2 Kings 5, was a great man with his master. And he was honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but he was also a leper. He was a leper. How many of you know lepers were outcasts? You could have everything going for you. But if you had leprosy, it would be like today, almost like having AIDS or something else, you know, that was people just kind of a little standoffish. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, would to God... Uh, would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him from his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus say, said the maid. Now this is hearsay. But this shows you the power of God's grace. Thus and thus said the maid that was of the land of Israel. 
And the king of Syria said, Go, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold, ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter has come to you, king, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant, servant to thee, that you may recover him of his leprosy. Now that is impossible. Now imagine somebody shows up at your door and they've got a Brinks truck full of stuff. It doesn't matter how much money you have. This type of thing can only be done by the hand of God. It came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive? That's probably the right response. Because certainly there was nothing he could do. That this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeks a quarrel against me. See, the thing was so absurd that he thought, man, this guy's trying to stir up some trouble with me. See, he didn't know what had happened. He didn't know that there was a, a little maid that knew that there was a prophet by the name of Elisha in the land who moved in the power of the Holy Spirit, as it were. And had told this and had been rumored and had gotten to the king. Then ultimately this had transpired. And it was so when Elisha the man of God had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes. That he sent to the king saying, wherefore have you rent your clothes? Let him come now to me and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Amen. You know what that makes me think of? That makes me think of the days of John the Baptist when, you know, his servants were sent to Jesus and said, are you the one or do we look for another? You know, I think the world looks at Christians these days and if you don't think it to be blasphemous for me to say, they look at us and are you the one or do we look for another? Are you the real deal? Are you nominal? Are you the real thing? Can I get to God from you? Are you a place that serves as it were like a ladder between heaven and earth where you have the words of eternal life? Not because you're Christ, but because Christ is in you. What a powerful thing. You know, God, if we would just simply walk in the Spirit could reveal to this world, as it were, that there is a prophet still in this land. There is still a voice that speaks for God in this land. God is still moving by his power in this land. Amen. Watch this. This is very powerful. So Naaman came with his horses, with his chariot. And he stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him. Now, he didn't even go out. It's like, I'm not even going to the door. I don't know, but that would probably be pretty offensive if you were a king using, used to getting your way. Moreover, here is a guy that had been living his entire life according to his own will. Doing what he wanted to do. Well, the king gave him orders. Of course, he would go out into battle, whatever the case may be. But he is going to, for the first time, be confronted by a word from the Lord. This isn't just man's word. How many of you know that the voice of God was in Elijah's mouth? He was the oracle. He was the place from which God was speaking. So that... This man could take hold of what was being said by faith and be healed of his disease. Very powerful thing to consider. Elijah, Elisha, rather, not Elijah, Elisha, didn't bother to go to the door. He sent a messenger on him saying, go and wash in Jordan seven times. And your flesh will come again to you and you shall be clean." Now, this is a picture. Naaman is a picture of a sinner, if you will, that desperately needs to be cleansed of his sin. And dipping seven times, seven in the scriptures, the number of perfection. 
This is a picture of being baptized by the Holy Spirit into Jesus Christ so that everything that he accomplished on the cross is made effectual to us. We're freed from sin. We're enabled by the power of the Holy Spirit to walk in the Spirit. And here is this picture, if you will, of a sinner. For the first time, he's going to hear from the Lord. My mind immediately cross-references to the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus. He says to him, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So why do you call me good? There's none good but one that is God. Rarely will you hear it, but that was Jesus clearly affirming that he was God in flesh. He wasn't saying I'm not good. He was saying you say that I'm good. You are suggesting that I'm God. Nevertheless, what did he say? Keep the commandments. Keep them from a child. I've kept all these things. Jesus said one thing you lack. And he put his hand on the controversy that existed between this young man and God. He put his hand right on the spot of the controversy. There are a lot of people that have a face to face with God. They'll come to an old fashioned altar right here at Rosa Sharon. Probably countless times this has happened. And as they prayed. The Holy Spirit put his hand on an area in their life and they refused to surrender that area to God. They refused. All these other things have I done. But God is wanting to establish lordship in our life. He is wanting to establish himself so that he can say to you, I want you to do this and you do it. I want you to stop doing this and you stop doing it. So on and so forth. He wants to establish his authority. And if Jesus couldn't tell the rich young ruler to go and sell everything and him do it, why should he just begin the process? Because down the road, there's probably going to be great sacrifices that have to be made. And if you're not willing to make this up front, you're surely not going to make it down the road. So God was just putting his hand right on the beginning. And the Bible said that he went away sorrowful. He went away sorrowful. When the Holy Spirit came into the world, he takes on the role of Jesus Christ in the earth. That's why it's so important when we're counseling people that at the altar, if you're ever talking to someone to say, whatever God's got his hand on in your life, surrender it to him. Don't try to make excuses. Don't, you know, sometimes people will look at you and say, you know, Brother Robert, do you think it's wrong to do such and such? Don't don't get between them and God. Your response should be this. If the Lord is dealing with you about that, surrender it to God. Because what can happen is the person can actually take your words and use them as it were against God. Well, Brother Robert said this is okay. But that it was a point of controversy between them and God. Now, God didn't tell me to go sell everything I had. But he's told me to do some other things. And it would be foolish for me to ask someone else what they thought, because typically it's not always going to be something that's a matter of sin. It may just be a matter of obedience. And that was the case with Naaman. God told him to go wash yourself seven times. It's a simple thing he wanted him to do. Just go wash seven times. And how many of you know he got angry? People seem to just always get angry when God says something, you know, but but that's the reaction. Naaman was wroth, verse 11. And he went his way and said, behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. See, he had it already figured out. And that's the problem a lot of times. We already got it figured out how we think God ought to do it. And he may take a totally different route than we expect. But it's not about God coming into compliance what I think he ought to do. It's about me being obedient to him. Watch this. And I will just say, are there not two rivers in Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away. 
in a rage. That sounded like he was a too happy camper. But you know, even as mad as he was, he still was able to listen to the voice of reason. He wasn't one of these guys that flew off the handle and suddenly became completely irrational. He still had a sense about him. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid you some great thing, would you not have done it? If he had given you something great to do, would you not have done that? That's what he's saying. Watch this. How much rather than when he says wash and be clean? Again, God's speaking. And I believe in the very mouth of these people, God is giving them the words to say to this man. And we've got to be able to discern when God is speaking to us. And it's not just a person. Say, well, they're not full of the Holy Spirit. doesn't make a difference. God can speak through anything. You remember he spoke through the mouth of a mule in the Old Testament. That's kind of sobering to consider. Kind of washes away all of our vain glory in one swipe. Then he went down and dipped seven times in Jordan. He simply did what God told him. And a lot of people would, you know, in their mind, well, I've turned to Christ. I've given God everything. I had a young person tell me that years ago, and it was such a mystery to me. I mean, I guess he was trying to cause me to waver in the faith. Well, made me think, well, I guess it don't work. No, I knew better. He was trying with all that was in, in him to convince me he had surrendered everything to God. But if you'll wait long enough, God will show you. They did not surrender everything to God. When you come to Christ, if something happens and God's drawing you, if you don't get anywhere with God, listen, the problem's not on God's end. You can stone me if you want to, but the problem is never on God's end. The problem is on our end. How are we responding? The rich young ruler went away sorrowful. Naaman went out in a rage at first. Uzziah went into the temple, couldn't be withstood. Eighty people couldn't stop this man. Think about that. Valiant men. People just bent on doing their own thing. Couldn't be withstood. But as something as simple as the Holy Spirit speaking to our heart, putting his hand on something, saying, I want that in your life. How many of you have read, read uh, Brother Kevin Vaughn's mother's testimony on Facebook? Anybody? Anybody read that? It's amazing how people could go their whole life. Their whole life. And never really get through to God. They learn how to shake hands at the back door and say amen when the preacher's preaching. They learn how to do everything right and play the part. And you can get pretty good at it. You can get really good at it. Only to come to realize when you're way up, what is she, 70? Something like that. Seventy years old. And finally, God does a work in your life because you're willing to surrender that area of your life that God's got his hand on. Finally ready to surrender to simply saying something like this. God, I can't do it anymore. I can't keep carrying this bitterness anymore. I'm ready to surrender it to you. (laughs) Felt a load lift off. It's like, man, I'm a new person. Radically changed. Naaman went down seven times. And the Bible said his flesh came again as a little child. God washed his past, as it were, away. I heard one preacher say one time, what about all the scars from being in battle? What about all the times he was cut? I mean, he probably looked like a really rugged man. Imagine that. Have you ever shook hands with somebody who thought, man, I bet you could strike a match on that hand? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> I've met some people like that. It's like, wow, man, you know, he must have 10 or 12 layers of skin on his hand. And they're all hardened. But you imagine the power of God in causing that to come like a little child. 
All the years of toiling in sin. All of the things that you had done that made you the person that you are. God transformed it in a moment. You became a new creature. That's what the scripture said. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. The former things have passed away and all became new. Naaman could have walked out of that river, looked down and said, Behold, the former things have passed away. All is become new. It's a picture of genuine salvation. The difference. One man started out running well. Towards the end of his life, he got off in the flesh. Another man lived his whole life doing what he wanted to do, heard the voice of God, responded in faith, started off angry. You know, a lot of times you might be preaching, folks get mad. They get angry. They might even go out in a rage. But would to God that when they got home, or maybe when they got in their car, God started to deal with them. There was maybe God began to speak into their heart and say, you know, why don't you just surrender? Why don't you just turn this thing over? Amen. I just want to pray this morning. I just want to pray. Lord, we're just so thankful for your grace. That you loved us so much. That you made a means by which we can respond to you in faith. That we could respond to the gospel. That we could turn away from our sins and turn to you and and experience what Naaman experienced, as it were. Not in the flesh or the body, but on a spiritual level. You make all things new. Lord, help us to understand that it's so important to totally surrender to you. and The thing that is the controversy between us and you, that we would completely surrender that. And that in that moment, Lord, you will transform us. All the feelings of conviction that we feel will suddenly be changed to joy and love and peace. Bring these thoughts home to us today. Apply them according to your spirit as is appropriate to you. In Jesus' name, amen.